What's up, everybody? Dr. Danny McLean here from ADIO Studios. Today, we've closed down this part of the clinic to bring you fantastic content about sprains, strains, and automobiles. It's a little play on words. What we're going to be talking about today is a lot of anatomy and physiology. So even if you don't think you've had a whiplash, you should watch. And what I will tell you is if you stick around with me through this, a couple of things. You will learn a lot about yourself, your spine, and how it works. You'll learn about the current model of healthcare and how to navigate it to make sure that you and your loved ones stay safe and healthy. And you'll also come to realize how many dysfunctions are associated with something you might have never even known about. So buckle up. We got an hour and about 100 slides. Don't worry, some of them are fun. We'll just zip right through them. So if you don't catch all of this the first time through, we are recording this so you can watch it again and again and again. I've taken years of my life to accumulate this much information and put it together in one concise presentation. I wouldn't expect that you get it all the first time, but we will make sure that this one is available to you. We've also recorded one other one. We have another one coming up on Wednesday. So if you know anybody that wants to see it, they can watch that one live. Uh, if you have any questions, post them in the comments below. And then when we're all done with this, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to take these videos and make a master video. And then you're going to get me doing Ridley Scott style commentary about the things I already told you about. If you want a deeper dive, submit your questions below and we will make sure to get them answered. Buckle up. Let's dive in. All right. So the presuppositions of this presentation, what do we think is already true? So if you're not familiar with these, this is a good place for you to start your learning. Above, down, inside, out. That's how power flows in the body. It's not just some metaphor for life and existence. It's a wiring diagram that talks about the brain, the spinal cord, spinal column, and the nerves that go out to the tissues. So this comes in handy when we talk about radiating pain. If there's a pinch up top, it's going to, it's going to interfere with the nerve signals from above, down, inside, out. So if somebody has pain or numbness and tingling in their fingertips, we assume that unless there was a direct trauma to the hand, there's something that's blocking the flow and it usually comes from above down. And the most common place that happens is at the intervertebral joint between two bones. We'll talk about that as we get further into the A and P, anatomy and physiology for all of you who don't know the acronyms. All right, nerves are delicate. They do not work properly under force. That can be compressive force or tensile force. If you push on it or pull on it, it's not going to work right. It's pressure equal to the weight of a dime that makes that nerve lose up to 60%. Uh, there was a study that showed that five to seven millimeters of traction on a spinal nerve makes that nerve lose up to 70% of its conductance. It's a, it's a good wire, but it doesn't work well if it's either squeezed or pulled. Your body heals as much as it can all the time. If your body's not doing what it should be doing, there's a reason for it. There's, it's either one of two things. There's only one way to be unhealthy, and that's to be out of balance. Balance is defined by homeostasis, by self-regulating. So if you're out of balance, there's only two ways to be out of balance, either excess or deficiency. So if you have something there that shouldn't be excess pressure, excess inflammation, excess compression, excess, pick anything, anything out of line or deficiency, you need something that you don't have. So your body is continuously trying to heal itself. So if you're not healing, there's a reason for it. It's not just because or natural aging or that's how everybody has it. That's not true. If everybody has the same kind of problem, it's not because people have that problem. It's because the healthcare system that we rely on doesn't fix the problem appropriately or people cause the problem to themselves. All right, your body is built like a tent, not a stack of blocks. There's a model called tensegrity. It's super cool. We're going to get into that. But a lot of times people start off this presentation thinking that they've seen a model of the spine and it's a bunch of blocks all stacked up and they're wired together. Um, and those models are actually really hard to create because that's a not, it doesn't reproduce the natural motion of the spine. Um, and we'll talk about that as we get into it. Western medicine is great at acute conditions, not with chronic. Now, I will say this now, and I will probably say this throughout the presentation. I think Western medicine is fantastic. They're really good at what they do. 
they don't do everything. Nor should we expect them to do everything. Western medicine is really, really good at what it's good at within its scope of practice and about 70% of the time, right? Carpal tunnel surgery works about 50% of the time. Knee surgery is about 50% of the time. Back surgery, eh, give or take 60%. So the point is, for some people, it's the best thing ever. I've seen that in my clinic, and I totally agree. My concern is not to try to take away what they're good at. My job is to fill in the gaps so that at the end of the day, the people that need help, regardless of what kind of help they need, they get that help. So they're great at acute conditions, not chronic. Chronic is anything that persists beyond three months of treatment. That's my jam. That's where I live. Okay. Western medicine is crisis intervention and is not designed for wellness. It's designed to cover the bottom 25% of health, not the 75% of health that you have to lose before you end up in a crisis. And certainly not designed to put you back at your top end best. It's to make sure that you prevent loss of life and limb. That's it. That's how you use that tool. That's what that system is designed for. If you're using it wrong, don't expect to get the right results. There's another tool that is designed for wellness. That's what we do. We're going to cover that today and why that's so important. Chronic wellness, that's my job. All right. Degenerative conditions take a long time to show up and are usually dismissed until they are too bad to be ignored. Do you see how that fits in the previous statement? Degenerative conditions, they're long and slow and subtle until they've had so much time to build up that they then break down. And once they've broken down, then you look for crisis intervention. But, but the problem is, it's not a disease, it's a dysfunction. It's degeneration. And that's really hard to fix. It's much easier to prevent, but you have to have the tools and skills necessary to identify it ahead of time and to walk through the process correctly so that you never end up at the breakdown. If you prevent the buildup, you prevent the breakdown, okay? Most physical modalities do not correct neurological problems. We talk about modalities. What is the method that we're using to treat? We're going to talk about at the very end. I, I have developed over a course of years and years, decades at this point, um, and hundreds of thousands of cases. The way that you, and according to the, the rule book, Guyton's Physiology, in case anybody wants to go look it up, it's fantastic. Um, according to the rule book, how your body wants to heal and in what is the biological priority? How do we work with the body to give you the maximum gain, to get you the most efficient way to get back to health and recover your life? All right. Three pillars of health are physical, mental, and chemical. So we're going to talk about that. That's the healing triangle. We'll jump into that. Did I miss anything? Nope. Okay, here we go. Here's some shocking statistics. Late effects of untreated whiplash or improperly treated whiplash. People tell me all the time, oh, I went and got checked out and they gave me some anti-inflammatories. Well, that's great. It fixed the chemical part, but it didn't fix the mechanical or the neurological part. That's improperly treated. The late effects of untreated whiplash or improperly treated whiplash eventually leads to degenerative brain disease. There's this teeny tiny little line right there. That's a link to that research study. Okay? All of this stuff is vetted. I've spent a lot of time putting it together. Oh, I brought my cats with me today to work. Okay, here we go. So whiplash begins the slow process of di disc degeneration and spinal arthritis. An estimated one-fourth of all whiplash patients experience chronic symptoms. 25% of people that have a whiplash have chronic symptoms. Chronic, degeneration, arthritis, degeneration. Do you see how we're not talking about crisis medication? We're not talking about crisis intervention. These are things that happen, and then eventually, a long, long, long time later, they break down. But in between there, there's this opportunity that relatively nobody's interacting with. Or, or worse, they're in interacting with improperly. Okay. An estimated two-thirds of all of my active patients in our clinic show clinical signs of unresolved whiplash. The majority of these patients had their injury years ago and have been treated by many other professionals. It is estimated that as many 6 million car crashes occur in the U.S. per year. Now, look at this number right here. Hold this in your mind. Ready? One, two, three. Now, look at this number. 80% of car accidents. Whiplash injuries occur in over 80% of car accidents. 80% of how many? 6 million. 6 million car crashes 
of which 80% of them result in whiplash. Now, what's interesting is, if you do this math, 6 million, 80%, it says 1.5 million whiplashes occur. Did it, anybody do that math? Do you, do you see how, because <laughs> I've been rolling this around in my head. All right, I, I'm not a mathematician, but 6 million, 80% of 6 million is not 1.5 million, right? Did everybody catch that? It should be like 4.8. Let's do that again. Six, six million car crashes, of which 80% end in car accidents. But this says 1.5 million. Did you notice that? Yeah, I did. I was like, that doesn't make sense. But I was in the middle of a video, so I just rolled past it. But I thought about it every day since the last time I did this presentation. I was like, somebody's missing, like, 3.3 million whiplashes every year. Yeah. This is 2010. Uh, and this one, we'd have to click on it. But um, but yeah, somebody's missing 3.3 million whiplashes a year. Do you want to be one of those people? Do you want your friends and family and loved ones to be with those people? No. Even in our statistics, we show that, by and large, the system does not process whiplash cases properly. That's terrible. All right, let's talk about transference of force, probably one of the most important components that's going to prepare you to think about the rest of this presentation correctly. Maestro, cue the video. That is called the transference of force. I wanted to make this video for a while, and I was like, well, wait a minute. Maybe somebody else already did. And I found that one. I was like, oh, that's perfect. Because in that instance, you have a large car and a small person. In this instance, we're talking about a motor vehicle collision. The car is the basketball, and the passengers are the golf balls. Next one. Oops, transference of force in action. Where was the rest of that force transferred? <laughs> Oops. Now, that's, those are fun videos. Go ahead and load it and pause it. Those are fun videos, but what they demonstrate is that people do not understand the concept innately. They, they drop the, the basketball and they anticipate that the can is going to, or the bottle is going to return to a certain height. And they did not predict the speed at which the, the can was going to leave the ball so that they could accurately catch it. If you notice, it hit before they even realized that it was happening. That's the same thing. That's just to demonstrate from, from a general standpoint that people don't really get transference of force. And that's super important because it's way different if you were to fall versus if you were to be involved in a motor vehicle collision. Now, this next video, um, I, I hadn't really thought about it. It talks about the law of inertia, which also talks about transference of force. Um, I hadn't thought about it prior. So if you have been in a crash and you still have some uh, emotional connections to that, if it still freaks you out a little bit, if there's maybe even a little PTSD from that, they're going to demonstrate what happens during a crash. Um, if you want to, to kind of mute and uh, close the video for just a second, we're going to play this. I will let you know when it's safe to come back. Trigger warning. Here we go. Newton's first law of inertia states that an object stays in motion in the same speed and direction unless acted on by an external force. Normally, a car and a donkey box can move around at the same speed, but when an external force is applied to the car, in this case by the crash test dog, the object moves continuously forward at the same speed.
to the board to play the band. This consists of two changes motions to support inertia, and in applying either mode the velocity is zero. It's this property that enables people to do things like this. So go ahead and play this next step. All right. There we go. All right. So in the first example, we see how the the car stops and the people keep moving. There was a MythBuster, so they've done this um, with a with a head-on collision, uh, where basically they measured the force um, and it basically nulls to zero. But the point is, um, with if there's involvement in a car crash, the, the car the near, the inertia of the people continue to move. Now, where that changes is if the car is struck from behind. Because then when the car, the person wants to stay still with their inertia and the car wants to move. So there's that transference of force from the car to the person and that's a lot of force. So even a small bump from behind can cause a significant whiplash because it creates this wave motion and that wave is then concentrated up the spinal column as it shrinks from your big lumbar vertebrae down to your small cervical vertebrae and even into your skull. That's where that whip crack motion happens and every part of the inertia that resists movement puts stress through that tissue or that, that substance. And in this case, the substance is you. Um, all right, so we're back. Okay, um, you can come back now, it's safe. Anyway, so here we go. If we look, people, if you've ever seen one of these, they're a cool little desktop item where you drop one ball, it hits the ball, and then the other ones come off the end. It's super interesting. Football, everybody understands that there's chronic concussion problems, CTE uh, with the brain, and that causes brain damage. Down here we have a picture of billiard balls where you hit one ball and other balls, and then the ball that you hit sometimes stays still and the other ones move. Um, of all of these demonstrations, this one over here, relatively little damage, almost no visible damage to the car. This one has the most force, and it has the greatest transference of force. So. Don't discount small crashes. They can cause lots of problems. Moving right along. Like we said, here's the research to back it up. Uh, Britical, British Medical Journal 2018. Even low speed collisions can cause serious injuries. Not just muscle soreness and stiffness, serious injuries. Whiplash can cause partial tearing of the ligaments in your neck. Now, ligaments, that's an important key word. We're gonna need that later. Why? Whiplash can cause partial tearing. How, how much tearing do you want to have? Zero. Partial's bad. Um, and ligaments, if you've ever sprained your ankle, that's a ligamentous injury. And you know that it can, be, it can be damaging when it happens, but it also can be problematic later on. And we're going to break that down for you. So here we have two researched sources saying something that's very important to connect the dots. Low speed, serious injury. Whiplash, partial tearing of ligaments in your neck. Here we go. Now thing that this does not talk about is probably the one aspect that I think is the most important. The anatomy and physiology. We're going to talk about the dura. Now, this image, I will tell you, was not easy to find because the dura has very little relevant information in the middle. Why? Because it connects down here and then all the way up here. And you're going to see that in the next slides. I spent probably a good four hours to find this picture and I, my Google foo is strong. Okay, so the dura mater, it means tough mother. It suspends, protects, and supports the central nervous system, brain, and spinal cord, okay? It anchors to the skull, neck, and pelvis. Here we go. Here is the upper connecting points of it. We're gonna start on this picture right here. It's this big green arrow, points right down here. And then you see the same thing over here, this optic chiasma. Uh, those are your optic nerves that go to your eye. Ever wonder why somebody gets ice pick headaches after a crash or they get migraines that shoot through? It's because there's a nerve that goes from the back of your skull uh, where your visual processing center is. There's a nerve that goes from back here all the way to the front through this area that goes to your eye. Now this area kind of here is blanked out with lots of detail, but here we can see that it goes right past this bony structure. Uh, you can also see there's this green line. If you look real close, there's a green line here. That green line is the endosteal layer, which runs with the dura. Endosteum is basically the outside of the bone. So there's this fabric of the body called fascia. 
and it makes up, it's made of collagen, and it makes up the outside layering of your bones, your muscles, your nerves, and your dura. So we see that as being very closely related with the optic nerve. That's an aha moment. Okay, but if you also look here, you see, right, this green kind of loop, and it's oddly shaped, so it's hard to get a good picture of it, uh, but that's dura, and it connects into what's called the cranial vault, basically the inside opening of your skull. Now, we'll go to the other picture over here. You see this right here, this red circle that says nerves? Oculomotor, trochlear, ophthalmic, maxillary. These are all nerves that go to your face. Very, very important. And again, they're in that endosteal layer. The, there's the meningeal layer right here. So the meninges of the dura. So dura, 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 meninges. So meninges is dura and a couple other components that are generally distinguished one, one to the other, but the dura is the tough one, and that's the one that has more structural relevance and cause more problems. And then, of course, down here we have the sphenoid air sinuses in this orange box. We look right here. Sphenoid air sinuses. Um, or sorry, sphenoidal air sinuses, uh, air sinuses. And if you look over here, the sphenoid is right there. Now, the sphenoid is the bone in the center of your brain. So you have skull, brain, bone. The bone in the middle of your skull that connects 12 of the 20 skull bones together is the sphenoid. That's the upper anchor point of the dura as demonstrated here. So, there you go. All right, moving on. Let me point out something to you real quick before we start unpacking this slide. This orange line right here, you see there's this dot, dot, dot. This is the top, this is the bottom. This is the top, this is the bottom. Everything between the top and the bottom is represented by this one thin orange line. That's like the most of your spinal cord. And it's just not here, uh, represented on this, on this picture because there's not a whole lot going on. It anchors at the top and the bottom and not really anywhere else in between. All right, but here we're talking about cerebral spinal fluid, which is your brain juice. It is what floats your brain, washes and nourishes the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and all your nerves. Now, let's take a checkpoint. Some of you might not know a lot about nerves. If you don't know a lot about nerves, um, they're what keep you alive. They direct, control, and coordinate the function of every single thing in the whole body. So if they're not healthy, you're not healthy. If the nerve goes down, so do you, right? Moving on. Okay. Uh, so cerebral spinal fluid, super important because if we look here, these green arrows show where this fluid leaves the brain. And if you notice, it has to go right here past the brain stem. This pink line represents where the base of the skull is, the foramen magnum, right? And if there's any kind of pinching, pulling, twisting, or compression on the dura, the fluid that is produced in your brain, you produce four times as much every single day as what you have in the system. That means that if there's a backup, your brain doesn't stop producing it. It just causes increased pressure. You don't want pressure on the brain. Remember, nerves don't like to be pushed on, and your brain is just a whole bucket full of nerves. And when they're pushed on, they don't work well. It turns out, very fascinating, every nerve, sorry, every part of your brain that regulates consciousness touches this fluid. So if it backs up and causes pressure, it's going to stretch the part of your brain. But what part of your brain? The parts of your brain that regulate consciousness. You see how that could lead to degenerative brain disease? All right, so now we're looking, we're looking as if we've taken somebody and cut them at the neck, looking down. Okay, here we go. Oh, there's a couple arrows on here. So, dura. This orange box points right here to this green line. This is the back of the body. This is the front of the body. We have this green line that comes down, and look what happens. It wraps around the nerves that leave this hole between two bones that go out to the body. They go out to organs. They go out to muscles. They go out to skin. And if this dura gets pulled or pinched or twisted it's going to cause compression or tension on these nerves. We're going to talk about that as we go along, but that's, this is base layer information. And if you notice, there's a bunch more orange arrows that go down this way to the front, and there's all these little, little anchor points and straps and so on and so forth. Um, it's really, really interesting stuff, but we don't have time to unpack every last little bit of this. General concept is dura goes around your nerves, 
and the space between the dura and the spinal cord, guess what this is? This, this blue ocean, that's brain juice, that's cerebral spinal fluid. And that pushes itself out through between the nerve and the dura and washes the nerve. Oops, too much, too many, too many. Here, so see the part right here where it says washes? That's how it washes. Cool, huh? I thought so. All right, so now we're looking from the back. If we were to take somebody and, and cut them here and look at them from this way. All right, there's technical names for the way that we look at stuff, but you know, I figured the hand drawing is probably better. All right, so here we have, again, represented in green is the dura. This bone right here is the bone at the base of your skull. It's called the mastoid process. It's part of your skull. Anyway, so you have vagus nerve, dura mater. The dura, look, 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 goes all the way down, 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 down. And look what happens. Just like we saw from the top down, here is represented the, the space between two bones where the nerves leave and they go out to the body. Nerve leaves and go out, goes out to the body in between these two bones. Um, and really here, this picture should show the dura continuing along. Uh, but once it leaves the spinal column, it's usually called the epineurium. Uh, they change the name, but the tissue doesn't change, uh, and it's still continuous. It's not like it stops and a new tissue starts. It's all continuous. Um, the, the problem is we learned a lot about the human body by cutting it apart. So we named it by the parts we found, um, and sometimes that's inconsistent with the way that it functions in normal anatomy. You also have these little anchor points. You see this little tab here, and over the side you have a tab and a tab and a tab. Now this whole thing was drawn. That means the artist had to look at a representation of reality and recreate what they saw. So everything in here is intentionally put here because it exists in the human body. All right, so the dura mater goes all the way down. Here's the spinal cord invested in the dura mater. Now, if we look here, this is the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve is named um, with the same Latin word derivation of vagrant, means to wander, because it wanders all down through the, the body cavity and controls every normal autonomic function from your belly button up. So heart, lungs, spleen, stomach, liver, gallbladder, so on and so forth, uh, thymus, thyroid. So it controls all their functions. And if you could imagine, if the dura was pulled, pinched, or twisted, it would put pressure on the vagus nerve. We know pressure on nerves is bad. Why is pressure on the vagus nerve bad? Because the vagus nerve maintains everything in your organ system from the belly. So could that cause asthma? Yep. Could that cause heart arrhythmias? Yep. Could that cause GERD, reflux, indigestion? Yes, yes, yes. How about gallstones? Yes. Now, when I say cause, I don't mean that it causes it actively. I mean it doesn't actively prevent them from happening because everything breaks down all the time. That's a, that's a good concept if you want to know more about that. My previous video where we talked about the gut-brain connection, I unpacked the vagus nerve for like a half an hour and it's fabulous. It really should be like three hours. Next. All right, here we are down at the bottom. Top, bottom. All right. So here we see our old friend, the dura. Here it's a dural sac because it comes to a, a closure, but there's this, what's called the phylum terminale. It's this line of, of basically like a kind of like a tendon or a ligament that comes down and it picks up the dura. The dura wraps around it, it goes all the way down here and connects to the cossacks. Teeny tiny little ligaments that hold it in place. The cossacks right here. Now, if you look at it from the side over here, it, all, it comes all the way down here. And you could imagine if you push this part forward, it would work like a lever and it would pull tension on the dura. Well, since it's continuous and it's very, very tough, it doesn't stretch very well. So if you were to push the cossacks forward, it would pull tension all the way up all the way up to the top, kind of like this. I don't know much about music, um, but I do know a lot about the spine. So one of the things that is my job to do is to help you understand what goes on inside your body. This is a conversation I have every day, all day long for the last 10 years, um, trying to help people understand why when they move their head, they get tingling down their arms, or why when they lift their legs, something else goes wrong in their shoulder, uh, or why they have neurological instabilities that cause the primary breakdown that leads to other breakdowns, right? 
So it's because your spine is strung like a guitar. If it's out of tune, it's off at every level. Now let's do, let's do this. Let's do some comparatives. So tuners, remember we said the dura attaches where? Attaches in the neck, right? Guitar has a neck, you have a neck. The tuners are up top, right? Technically, I think that's the head of the guitar. Anybody musically inclined want to fill me in on that? Drop a comment below. I'm always willing to learn. Um, anyway, so in your neck, you have occiput, C2, and C5. That's the base of your skull, just under your skull, and then kind of right by where your shoulders come into your neck. Then you have different levels. Then you have anchor points down here. Now, in a guitar, this doesn't move. In the human body, it does. So if your sacrum or your tailbone move, it's going to pull tension up. And just like if the tuners in your neck move, they're going to pull tension down. But what we know to be true is if, if the string is pulled too tight or too loose, it's going to be wrong at every level. And that's literally what we're looking at here. Okay. This is super important for conceptualizing what we're going to talk about next. Not all bones of our equal importance. The dura attaches to the skull, which is at the occiput, also into the skull at the sphenoid bone. We talked about that. C2, C5, and then down at the bottom, sacrum and cossex. Directly. It is directly attached with dural anchor points. It anchors in. That means those bones are far more important than other bones. Now, there is a muscular at attachment that attaches to C1. C1 is a really we weird bone. It's really interesting. There's a muscle slip that attaches to the dura. There is also a muscular attachment that, that attaches from the tongue to C1. This is why a lot of times when people go in for dental work, they're like, yeah, my teeth are great. My dentist was awesome, but now my neck is bothering me. Oh, probably because when they were moving your tongue around, having your jaw open like that, it pulled on your spine. And if it, if it, if it attaches to C1 and C1 moves, now you could have problems everywhere. Um, quick fun story. I had a lady that used to come to see me on a regular basis until we got her to, to hold. Now she comes in kind of as needed. Uh, but her knee went out on her, and her, her knee was causing her lots of problems. I fixed her C1. Her knee pain went away. That's the only bone I adjusted on her because that's the only bone I found that was out. So I adjusted it. Her knee got better. She said, that's weird. I said, that's weird. Uh, so then she was good for a while. She slipped and uh, you know, put her neck back out. Knee went out again instantaneously. Came back in, fixed it. Problem went away. We did this cycle until she finally was able to hold it. No more knee problems. <laughs> okay. When these bones move out of place, they pull tension on the dura. Okay. Here's the statement of relevance. Meningeal vertebral ligaments may be implicated in pathological conditions of the spinal canal. Remember I said dural anchor points? This word right here, meningeal, ver I can't even put the whole thing in the highlight. Meningeal vertebral ligaments. Those are the dural anchor points because a ligament attaches a non-muscular structure to another non-muscular structure. Those are the dural anchor points. And scientifically referenced, saying there is a valid concept that describes how they could be implicated, the cause of, or involved in pathological conditions of the spinal canal. What lives in the spinal canal? The spinal cord. The spinal cord is a nerve bundle that regulates, coordinates, and controls the function of every cell in the body. See why that's important? Here we go. All right. Not all bones are of equal importance. See that? See this? See that? So I like this group. This, uh, they do a lot of research. Um, in fact, if you're on my Facebook, you'll see them. They post a bunch of stuff for me. I love their work. Uh, they're, they're helping me bring information to people so they can, then those people can then come to see me and improve their health. So this is an, uh, an advertisement that they put out basically helping to educate people. But if you notice something, tuners in the neck, anchors in the base. Tuners in the neck, anchors in the base. Look at this. Where do they highlight the areas? Up at the top, not only not only where the nerve problem is, but where those nerves radiate. And then down here, same thing, down to the base, okay? Now let's read what it says. Chronic neck and low back pain has been linked to motor vehicle accidents. Why? The most fascinating thing to me about this is they nailed it. They looked at the, they looked at the expression of the problem or the disease process in the population and say, this happens all the time. 
They even made a picture to represent that. But they never once described the dura. The trouble is, if you just talk about it from neck and back pain, we already know how to deal with neck and back pain. We're great at it. In fact, chiropractors are the number one kind of doctor that deal with neck and back pain. But they don't mention the dura. So what happens if you use the wrong tool or an inadequate tool to treat the problem that you think it is that it really isn't, right? So why is it neck and back pain? Is it because there's a bone out of place there or is it because of something else? And that's the question we have to ask. We have to differentiate the cause. All right. Wow. Incoming wall of text. <clears throat> the attention paid to the structures surrounding spinal nerve roots in the intervertebral foramina and the anterior dural attachments are largely ignored. This is what you need to focus on. Largely ignored. Although they have been described since the last decades of the 19th century. That's the 1800s. 1800s. It's over 100 years ago. 130 years ago? Oh. Uh, anyway. These anterior attachments were systematically studied in a series of 30 cadaver dissections and were found to be present in almost 94% of cases. All right, hold on for one second because I feel like we talked about this already, but it was a, it was a couple of slides ago, so I'm going to zip back and zip forward. Hold, buckle up. All right, so look. Intervertebral foramina, anterior dural attachments. What does that sound like? Do, 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 do. Oh, there we go. Here, look. Intervertebral foramina. Look right here. Of the intervertebral foramen. That's this hole in between these bones. That's this hole between these bones. Right here. Okay? Now that we have the picture, let's go back to the words. It says, very specifically, largely ignored, even though they're there. And we know that those... Oops. Those specific things can be implicated in pathological conditions, yet they are largely ignored. Why would you ignore something that is known to cause problems in the entire spine? The alar and transverse ligaments are often damaged during a car accident. Those are the, the ligaments of the neck. Here's another supporting document to show that car accidents damage neck ligaments. That's all you need to know for this. This is an easy one. All right. So he, here's one thing that a lot of people don't understand that I think would help them to process their condition much more efficiently and have a clearer expectation of why they're doing what they're doing. Physiology. We've moved away from the structures. Now we're into the functions. Healing time of tissue. Looky here. Here we have down here is the time scale. Minutes. 60 minutes is one hour. Yellow is hours. 24 hours is one day, down here days, seven days is one week, um, weeks down here, uh, and then we go down here, four weeks is a month, month is 12 into a year. Okay, everybody got that? So, these are all the different things that happen during healing times of different tissues. Now look, when does inflammation start after injury? It could start as soon as one hour, but if you notice, it kind of fades in. Um, anywhere from two hours all the way up to two weeks. This is why a lot of times when people are in a crash, they say, oh, I didn't feel anything till later. Like, they'll be evaluated at the scene. They're like, are you okay? And they're like, yeah, I'm still in shock. I don't feel anything. But they don't know they're in shock. So they just say, yeah, I'm fine. I don't feel anything. And then later on that evening when they go to bed or the next day when they wake up or a week and a half, two weeks later when they go to do something normal, routine, and mundane, like, I don't know, pick something you do all the time, for me, it's go to the refrigerator, you open the door, all of a sudden you're like, oh no. Or like laundry, I heard that's rough, haven't done much of that, but I do know that it's kind of tough on the body. Uh, and if you've been involved in a crash and the inflammation kicks in when you're not expecting it, you're going to falsely attribute that pain to whatever it is that you're doing at the time. Depends on where you're at in your life. A lot of times people, it's, it's picking up their kids, picking up stuff in and out of the car. Inflammation sometimes takes a while to show up. All right, what else takes a while to show up? Tissue remodeling. Look at here. If you notice, if we go all the way down here, see this number right here? 50% of normal tissue strength happens somewhere between 
day seven, but it takes about 12 to 24 months to heal. It takes 50, it takes up to 24 months to get 50% of the strength back. Now, I know some of you said, I've hurt myself and I recovered way faster than that. Now, here's the thing that most people don't get because you have to compare this fact with another fact that says most, this is actually done by the United States Marines. Um, this is why they're able to push their soldiers so, so much further so they can accomplish a great many things. By the time you're ready to give up, you've only used about 30% of your functional capacity because you're normally used to using 20 to 30% of your capacity during your normal everyday life. So if you have 50%, of a window, within that window, can you still do da activities of daily living at 20 to 30%? Yes. Would you ever really notice? No. When would that become a problem? It's when you're pushed beyond what you do normally. You have a slip and fall, another car crash, heaven forbid. You know, you have these issues that come up, but you would never notice it. So this is one of those things that I, a real life story, person was involved in a crash, we helped them get better. Six months later, this is in, in the winter time, car crash, snow, ice, whatever. Summertime comes around, six months later, they go out on a boating trip, choppy water, they're getting bounced around. When they were done, they had an excruciating headache, eye pick, migraine, low back with radiating pain down their leg. They had symptoms up top and down below. And they said, yeah, we've been boating before, this has never happened, this came completely out of nowhere. I said, I need to make a slide to explain that to people because it doesn't make sense that it could be fine for a while and then randomly show up out of nowhere. The problem is she was living a pretty narrow life. She wasn't doing much crazy, but the, the repeated jarring of the boat across the water reactivated and pushed her beyond the 30% into the 50% where she started experiencing symptoms again because she wasn't fully healed up to 24 months later. You know where else this makes a difference? People that do impact sports, people that do like uh, endurance sports, like running and cycling. Uh, or if you've had two or three or four car crashes, have those patients, they're not doing great, they're doing better now, but weren't doing so great. If you've had two or three or four car crashes within the span of this time, because every one of them gets worse than the previous one. Because you weren't healed from the first one, and then you take mostly damaged tissue and re-damage it. Remember we said partial tearing? Well, guess what happens if you partially tear, partially tear, partially tear? Eventually, you could lose the whole darn thing. All right. Super important, 50%. Ugh. Now, we're gonna talk about how the body works and why ligaments are more important than bones. See this model over here? This is a triangle with a stick and a, tri and a, and a triangle with a stick. None of, the, none of the mechanical parts are touching each other. What is? These tension units, these strings. This is how your body works. And we have the, uh, the, the Kool-Aid person representative here to say, oh yeah. All right, is this how it works? Grumpy Cat says, nope, it's not a stack of blocks. Look at this bridge. Oh yeah, that's a good looking bridge. Now, let me point out a few details here. This bridge has a bunch of cables. Those cables are tension units. They pull on stuff. Well, technically gravity pulls on them and they resist the pull. Um, so here we have, transfer, we have the uh, force that is directed downward on the bridge by gravity that pulls down, but it pulls on each of these cables, and each of these cables pulls on yet another cable that is strung by this strut that stands vertically against gravity, and then the force is transferred along the cables and anchored into the earth, either directly down or along. That's how your spine works. That is a beautiful representation, which is why there's so little to the bridge, yet it's so strong. Stack of blocks, uh, nope. Tent, yes. Now remember we pointed out in the spine those little anchored tabs? Look what we have here. Anchor tabs into a bony, uh, into a into a rigid structure. In this case, it's a flexible rigid structure, uh, but we have this fabric that is suspended by tabs. I was like, oh yeah, that's a good one. We need to include that one. So here it is. You're welcome. What does it look like in real life? Here's what your skull looks like. Now, this model does not represent all the interdigitations, the interwoven pieces, but your skull does move. It does flex. And here's how, here's the anchor points. Here's looking at it from below. If you look over here in this corner, you can see teeth. That's the back molars. Here's the cheekbone. And then this is basically where your ear is. Here's the base of your skull. Uh, but you can see on this exploded view, there's 
anchor points in the skull, and the whole thing moves and floats. And again, you we're looking at it from sort of a back and away. You can, if you look down here and again in the corner, you can see teeth. So we're looking sort of at the back of somebody's head. This is the zygomatic arch. Uh, obviously, this is the back of the skull right here. This is what would rest in your pillow. Uh, here's looking directly into the eye socket. And one of my favorite things that we see is a sphenoid. Here's the sphenoid bone. It goes back inside, and it's the, it's the back part of your eye socket. So sometimes, if you've had a bad enough whip whiplash, your head will be twisted and your eyes won't be the same level and one eye socket will be a little bit deeper than the other. It's one of the first things I check when I'm looking at my patients. All right, so here's a, theory, here's a 3D representation of an actual spine. I think this is a whale spine. And then we have a ball and stick model and then we have a, a 3D model made here. But if you notice, these strings pull the bones apart, so the bones really float. Uh, they've shown that if you were to analyze the spine with Newtonian physics as a method of biomechanics, you could not lean more than 15 degrees one side or the other because of leverage. You would crush the bone because of how much pressure it takes to crush a bone plus how much. We've seen gymnasts and people that do parkour and skaters and all sorts of cool athletic things where people do way more than 15 degrees, high velocity, and the reason why that works is because the amount of force that is transferred through the spines is not really transferred through the bones, it's transferred through the ligaments. Um, side note, also super important why they say bone on bone is bad. It's not because of the bones, it's because the ligaments have broken down. If you pull suspension, pull tension back into the ligaments, the bones then float again and they stop grinding against each other. All right, here's a model of the spine. This is all just sticks. Here's a model of the pelvis. See the lines of force? And guess what we have here? Green arrow represents sacrum. Orange arrow, cossex. Here we have the stick model with sticks and wires. Um, and this is actually a functioning model that represents the way the pelvis actually moves. Here you have it in, in a real setting. All right, so here's the tensegrity model of the foot. This guy, the knee. And then here's a stick and string model of the whole lower leg apparatus attached to the pelvis. So you have hip, knee, ankle, foot bones, okay? So you can imagine that in between here, there should be ligaments that hold these two bones apart. Uh, and that's what prevents you from having bone on bone grinding knee pain. If we fix the ligaments, the, bone, uh, the bones actually go back to being somewhat suspended and they stop grinding on each other. All right, here's a full body model. What's interesting about this is if you push it I saw a video on this. If you push it, it automatically readjusts its posture so it doesn't fall over. Your fascial system is somewhat self-regulating because of the way the structure is designed. This is amazing stuff. Now, the problem is if you go in there and you pull on any one of those strings anywhere, the whole thing will twist and distort. I have a little model, not this complex, but I have a little model with six sticks and strings that show this in my office. So. Here we have yet another, so this is inside, this is outside. So you have all of, if you can see these lines that run all over the body in here, these are different fascial planes that pull on the outside of the body to keep it in its container. If you have tension or compression or damage, whether it's through compression or uh, incision or anything else along these lines, it's gonna disrupt the way that your body organizes itself and it's gonna put more stress through the joints. Which joints? All of them, okay. so. How bad could it be? Whiplash creates minor injuries leading to long, slow degenerative breakdown that is multi-systematic and multi-symptomatic. Now, remember what we said, what is Western medicine good at? Not this. Who's good at this? Me. Got it? Okay, here we go. Up to 40% of people have pain seven years after their whiplash injury. Why do you think that 40%, almost half, seven years later, who wants that? Nobody. We got to fix it. A simple pathognomonic concept that is narrowed spinal canal causes compression of the enclosed cord leading to the local tissue ischemia injury and neurological impairment fails to explain, fails to explain the entire spectrum of clinical findings observed in clinical spondylitic myelopathy. So myelo is pain, pathy is, uh, sorry, myelo is muscle, pathy is pathology. So basically what they're saying is the, what we use right now, this general idea that, that Bones compressing that cause, that cause compression of the cord and local tissue ischemia leads to injury and it fails to explain the entirety of the spectrum of clinical findings. Simply stated, 
compression, the current model, is inadequate to explain all of the damage that we see in the clinical setting. Okay? So compression doesn't cover it all. This is what we're currently using. This is what most every discipline is looking at, including most chiropractic. Abnormal or excessive motion of the cervical spine results in increased strain and shear forces that cause localized axonal injury within the spinal cord. So this says, very specifically, tension, the new model, explains accurately where damage occurs and what type of damage occurs where. It says localized. And what? Axonal. The axon is the long part of the nerve that goes to where it's supposed to go. That's the like electrical cord part of the nerve. And if that part is damaged, then wherever that damage happens from above down, from that point down to out, stops functioning correctly, right? And we know that it is caused by what? Very specifically caused by excessive motion of the cervical spine. What do you think happens to whiplash? Whack! Exactly that. All right. Exonal injury reproducibly occurs at sites of maximal tensional, uh, tensile loading. That means we know that, we know that when nerves are stretched from excessive cervical spine motion, it causes axonal injury. We know also that reproducibly, we can do this over and over, it occurs at the sites of maximal tensile loading, meaning where it's the most stretched. Where's the most stretch going to happen? Where it anchors. If you have a bone that moves, that's pulling, that's pulling tension on the spinal cord, but it's not attached to it, it's not going to pull that much. Where it's, where it's attached at those attachment points, you're going to have the maximal amount because it's when the bone moves, that axon, the spinal cord, is going with it. And then there's a whole bunch of words here to say that we know not only what happens, but what, what, what happens first, next, and last, and in great detail. Okay, so intracellular events. We're picking up right here. A well-defined sequence of intracellular events. Myelin, stretch. So myelin stretch injury happens. Altered axolemnal, uh, axolemnal, easy, right? I'm a doctor. I totally got this. All right. Um, permeability, calcium entry, cytoskeletal collapse. Cytoskeletal. This means this, that means the thing that keeps the cells structured breaks down. Compaction of the neurofilaments and microtubules. This is how, these are like the veins and arteries. So like, if we look at this from a cell level, this is the skeleton that collapses. The neurofilaments, basically the, the intercellular nerve fibers and microtubules, those are like veins and arteries. So when you stretch a nerve, all of its substructures collapse. Kind of like if we were to grab a whole person and pull on them, all the stuff inside would just fall apart. Kind of like what happens inside each one of your cells. They, sell this, they say that a cell is the smallest representation of the whole. So bones, nerves, arteries, with inside the cell, collapse. Okay, And then basically the fluids don't move around right, accumulation of organelles, basically everything explodes and then the thing kind of dies. That's what exotomy means. Um, so Kind of like if you were to take a person and stretch them too much, everything would break down. Um, same thing happens to your nerves. Simple. Concept. Tension. The new model explains accurately location, mechanism, and progression of the disease process. We understand exactly what happens, why it happens, and in what order it happens. So we can accurately intervene with this. All right. The most significant consequence of overstretching nerve fibers is impairment of their conductivity. What do nerves do? They conduct. If that's impaired, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Remember ADIO? If the nerve cannot send signals to the organ, the organ stops regenerating and starts to decay. Excessive tension in the cord may produce measurable changes in motor sensory and autonomic function. This right here is such a key piece. Excessive tension in the cord. What pulls tension on the cord? The dura. So we can check the dura. And how do we check it? Motor, sensory, and autonomic. Autonomic function is really hard to measure. Sometimes it shows up on blood labs and says, oh, well, that's odd. Why does that happen? Why is it that we're seeing a bunch of liver stuff, or why do you have this weird kidney finding? That's as close as we get to measuring nerve function from an autonomic. Um, there's other ways, but they're way fancy. Um, anyway, so sensory, sometimes we get people that say, oh, it hurts this finger or these two, just these two. But motor is easy. 
because we can test muscles. And we know muscles are supposed to be relatively the same strength and hold good resistance and stable contraction. So I present to you this fact. If we're doing all this damage to nerves, where's the biggest cluster of nerves in your body? The brain. Mild traumatic. Kind of an oxymoron, right? You don't want any traumatic. Mild is also bad. Um, whiplash can cause mild traumatic brain injury because it damages nerves. Okay. So, oh, you know what? My well, bad. So I was totally leading into another slide. That's coming up later. Where we actually demonstrate exactly how we test motor. That's in the therapeutic part of it. All right. I got a little ahead of myself. I got excited for the cool stuff. I mean, really, it's all cool, but here we go. So brain trauma causes neuropsychiatric dysfunction. What? Okay, car crash, back hurts, neck pain, you know, maybe I got to wear a brace, do some stuff. Now we're talking about brain damage. Neuro and psychiatric, because of the brain damage, there are neuropsychiatric dysfunctions. Depression has also been reported following whiplash injuries in one study, 42.3% of 5,211 subjects. That's not a small number. That's pretty solid evidence. Subjects who did not have pre-injury mental health problems were reported, dep reported depressive symptoms within six weeks of the injury. Depression caused by whiplash. The symptoms were recurrent or persistent. So recurrent meaning if they went away, they came back, or persistent, they never went away in almost 40% of the cases. Holy cats. So 40% or 42% and then of almost 40% of the cases, it stuck around, meaning it was just there forever. The, the ability of the limbic system to function and express itself without interference requires a subluxation-free spine. That's scientific research that says if you have misalignments in your spine, your limbic system, the thing that controls your emotions is not going to work properly. It cannot express itself without interference. Your emotions are going to be all messed up if your spine is not free of subluxations, meaning misalignments that cause pain and afferent signals. The subconscious is in the spinal cord and even lower. That means this is information that you don't even know is happening because it's not part of the conscious mind. You just feel sort of like the background is awful. You just feel crabby and you don't know why. You're like, also hostility and anger are part of this, this expression. Now, the subconscious extends it uh, to one's T cells, immune system, and even one's monocytes, immune system. So now we have traumatic brain injury whiplash causing emotional is dysregulation as well as immune system dysregulation. That's a bigger problem than sore back and neck. All right, and here we go. Transition from acute to chronic pain. So pain happens over here. There's fear, worry, and anxiety. That's step one. Initial psychosocial distress, right? Natural emo it's a natural emotional response to potential harm. It happens. You are worried about it. Here we go. Stage two. Development of, ex of exacerbation of psychological problems formed depends on pre-morbid personality and psychological characteristics. So if you're generally a pretty resilient person, maybe it doesn't affect you so much. Maybe if things weren't already great for you, it makes it much worse. And that's what that says. And then it talks about some of these really bad things like depression, anxiety, somatization, turning thoughts and worries and fears into physical body expressions. Substance abuse, we'll talk about that too. Um, and that's not always by choice. It's not like, man, my life's terrible. I'm going to go get hooked on drugs. No, people are trying to solve problems and they're given inadequate solutions. So those inadequate solutions become their own problems. You see how one problem gets the next, gets the next. And then by the time you're done, everybody has told you what you're doing is right and you're not better. So then that's your fault. What? Psycho, uh, psychophysiological, this right here, psychophysiological disorders, psychophysiological disorders. What does that sound like? Does anybody understand what that means? I do, and that's scary. So here's the thing. Psycho, meaning mental, emotional, physiological. You ever get like, watch a, like a horror movie and your heart's racing out of your chest and maybe you get like nervous and worried and feared and scared? Um, and then like people get stressed out, like you can worry yourself sick. That's what that's talking about. It kind of pairs with the somatization, but it's psychophysiological. Your body is responding to a stress or a, a trauma or a damage that isn't still happening yet. And this is stage two. This is after, oh, after a while it's been there. 
but your body's responding as though trauma is still present, and it's not. Symptom magnification. Learned helplessness. I guess this is just as good as it's going to get. And not like anybody ever wants to get there. They just don't have a good option to fix it. That's why I'm doing this presentation. Because I've spent a long time to figure this out, and I've helped a lot of people, but I know there's a lot more people that I haven't been able to get access to. This information is exactly for these reasons. So what happens in stage three? Mental deconditioning. Acceptance of sick role. People are just like, I, that's just who I am now. From something, arguably, they may not have caused. If you're sitting in traffic and somebody behind you and all of a sudden this happens, oh, no, not OK. Exemption from normal responsibilities and obligations. So if, if mom is hurt and she can't cook dinner or do housely duties, or dad is hurt and he can't do things like whatever dads do, mow the lawn, fix things. Those are some of the things that I do. Um, cook meals also, right, because everybody belongs in the kitchen. Let's go cook some food, get healthy. All right. Anyway, point is, exemption from normal responsibilities and obligations. If you assume the sick role, people like let you out of stuff. But I, I will guarantee you the vast majority, 999 out of 1,000 people that I've ever met that have this don't want it. They're not like, oh, sweet, I get this disability vacation. No, nobody wants that. Consolidation of no abnormal illness behaviors. That basically means all these other things that go into it, they're just like, oh, well, this is who I am now. And it becomes part of their personality. And they never, they never wanted that. And imagine if this all shows up 10 years, seven, remember that slide that says seven years later, 40% of people, this is the symptoms they're talking about. They're persistent. All right. Misalignment of the spine can cause dysphoria to depression. Reduced autonomic function, things like wake, rest, sleep, digestion, detoxification, cellular clearing, diminished immune function. So that's what, if your immune system doesn't work, you get sick all the time. You know what else happens? If your body doesn't clean itself out, that leads to cancer, right? So cancer happens six times a second in every person who is alive today, but their immune system recognizes the bad cell breaks it down, recycles it, and goes on with life. You have 42.7 trillion cells. You reproduce 1% of your cells every single day. Some of those are going to be bad copies. Your immune system breaks them down. But what happens if that's diminished? And this can be permanent if it's not treated. Whiplash can cause pain, stiffness, headaches, and memory problems. And memory problems. And, and memory problems. All right. A problem well-defined is half solved. Why have I walked you through all of this stuff? If you notice, it's all over the place. It seems as though it's multi-systematic and multi-symptomatic. It has to be holistic for us to get all of it. I guarantee you this isn't even all of it. This is just the highlights of what I thought was most important with a little bit of explanation of each of those. There's way more, way more than what I've included in this presentation. Like I said, this could be three days of just unpacking this. All right. So. A problem well-defined is half solved. Something that's out of place is easy to see. What is missing is very difficult to see. All right, this is a fun little game that they uh, put in like kids' magazines. You got to spot the differences, right? I'll save you the trouble. There they go, right? So if you look up here at the top by the bush, there's nothing there. Over here, there's a bike. Over here, this lady's doing yoga on a yellow mat. Here she's just totally experiencing nature and to the fullest with no mat. Over here, there's a picnic basket. Over here, their picnic basket has been robbed. Um, over here, there's uh, nothing. Over here, there's a, a critter poking out of the bush. Uh, over here, duck, 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 duck. Over here, we just have duck, duck, duck. Uh, here we have swan. Over here, we have swan, swan. Um, over here, they're playing frisbee. Over here, they're playing ball. Squirrel, 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 squirrel. OK, now, one thing you might not have noticed, if you didn't know to look for it, is this one. Oh, this is what happens to doctors. It's called search satisfaction. The reason why you find your car keys in the last place you looked is because once you found them, you stopped looking. Same thing here. What happens if you found all those symptoms? And you're like, oh, all the red ones, we got it. Got every last one of them. And then you're like, uh-oh, we missed one. That's why it's important to know all the pieces. 
This is why it's hard to get the right diagnosis. If it has webbed feet, it lives in the lake. If it has a bill, it's a platypus. See? Meets all the criteria. Totally not the thing you thought it was, unless you've seen this before. All right. If you have a crash where there's transference of force of the spine that then causes distortion of the spine and tension in the meninges, dura, that causes a pinch nerve due to the skull injury that then causes decreased production of stomach acid, that's the other presentation, that then leads to bad digestion, that leads to gallstones, proven fact, chronic inflammation, joint problems, depression, poor immune system function, that leads to allergies and eventually autoimmune disorders, chronic fatigue, thyroiditis, kidney or heart disease, who do you go see? What doctor, there's at least four or five or six different kinds of doctor if you went to a specialist that would have to look at this. Sometimes in a world of specialties where everybody lives in their silos, people fall through the cracks because they're taught to stay in their lane and they do a great job of it. Please don't misconstrue this as me bagging on them. There are problems that are way more complex than what they are there to solve because I will tell you that the cardiologists are fantastic at dealing with heart disease. But sometimes the heart disease isn't the, isn't the main problem. The heart disease is a symptom of a deeper issue. And in this case, that's what this describes. Here's an interesting thought. Thyroiditis. We look at it right here, right here. Thyroiditis. 90% of thyroid cases are autoimmune. Yeah. So we should be looking at that first before we ever try to fix the thyroid. Now, that being said, depending on how late things are, you might have lost some function to the sands of time, the passing of time. Some things are not recoverable. But if we find it early, arguably, we can either reduce or prevent some or all of this. And that depends on the person and how bad it was. All right, what's wrong? Allopathic doctors are trained to stay in their lane and refer out, which is fantastic. They're doing a great job. What's not right? This is the essential question that I ask. What's not right? Holistic doctors, like myself, are trained to think and link, put problems together into one Nice, neat little package. Figure out what the constellation is. Figure out what things in, are, should be included and what things should be excluded. How many specialists will it take to fix the problem if they miss the big picture? How does that present itself in real life? It is estimated that 94% of back surgery patients still experience pain after surgery. It is called failed back surgery syndrome. 2017. I've seen back surgery save somebody's leg. That's fantastic. But 94% of patients still have pain after surgery. There was another study that I read that showed if you do a specific kind of adjusting, it was done by an orthopedist, by the way, if you do a specific kind of adjusting, you can help fix people that have had chronic back pain for 10 years or more. And it was over 80% of them had complete resolution of their back pain. Three years later, 65% of those people that had resolution still had no recurrence of back pain. When you do the common things of life uncommonly, you command the attention of the world. This is George Washington Carver. Uh, that's what they, they called him Mr. Peanut. He was the guy that figured out to, you could do like a thousand things with peanuts. He's the, he invented peanut butter. One of my favorite guys. All right. Patient values. This is the gold standard of clinical practice. Patient values. What do you want? Are you willing to participate in the plan? Research. What is already known? If you notice, things in here, all the stuff that we're basing our presuppositions on are all researched facts. I'm not making any of this stuff up. In clinical experience. What I, what I can tell you that I have made up is the synthesis. How does this fact and that fact and this fact and that fact show up as a clinical presentation for a patient? And how do we use that in a meaningful way to get you better? This is why we do what we do the way we do it. Why? 67% of our active patients show clinical signs of unresolved whiplash. These patients are patients that have seen many other health professionals, but none of them got the diagnosis correct. Why? because they didn't see the signs and they're not trained to look at it the same way that I am. That's fine. I wouldn't put myself in an OR and do surgery on somebody. No, uh, -uh. I wouldn't even want to stitch somebody up. Not my job, not my expertise. This totally mine. Standard of care dictates that they have to follow the established protocol. Why? Because the established protocol works for the majority of people. They do the majority stuff. I do the exception processing and they have to follow the prescribed treatment. Even if they think something else might be better, they are still held to the standard of care. I get to be flexible to, so that we can figure out exactly what works for you. Shots equal short re relief. If you get a shot, it might help for a period of time. I will tell you, I have some patients that come in, terrible pain, tons of spasms. They get a shot, 
the spasms go away, it gives me a space to operate in where they're not gonna have more pain and more spasms. We can actually get in there and fix the real problem. It's like an umbrella. Like if I'm gonna fix a roof leak, I don't wanna fix it while it's raining. And if it is raining, I wanna have an umbrella. That's what this does for me. I think that this is valid. I don't think this is the end of the line. I don't think this is the last step. I think this is a, a step that can be used just like if you're gonna have surgery, they use anesthesia. Sometimes a shot will give you enough pain relief that your muscles stop spasming that we can actually do the real work to get you actually better. Because we'll talk about that in a minute. Your paradigm dictates your results. Your map defines your destination. If I was to give you this map and say, this is uh, Chicago, I want, you to, I want you to go use this map to find a specific location for a pickup or a delivery. You'd never get there. Why? Even if you went really fast, even if you tried super hard, even if you did everything you possibly could to follow this map, better because this is a map of Glasgow. This is not Chicago. If you have a bad map, you will never get where you want to go. Opiates are highly addictive. Remember we talked about the, the psychological component? Opiates are highly addictive and not meant to be used for chronic pain. This was by the CDC in 2020. This is recent and by a well-established group. Not meant for chronic pain. Moving on. Okay. The localization of pain not only varies in the site of compression of the dural tube, oh look, our friend the dura, but is also determined by the intensity of the stimulation. One of the rules of referred pain is that the stronger the stimulus, the further the pain, let's go right here, the further the pain will be referred. Above, down, inside out. If you have a pinch somewhere and it's real bad, it's gonna show up farther away. As we start to heal you, it goes in reverse. It's called centralization. That's where we go down here, okay. Uh, this has some practical bearings when it comes to evaluation of therapy. When the pain has originally been located in the buttock, but during a manipulative session, an adjustment, tends towards the center and becomes paravertebral along the spine, so it goes from uh, down to up. This implies that pain stimulus has been reduced and discodural, disc meaning disc, uh, disco meaning of the disc, dural meaning the dura, discodural contact is now less pronounced than it was. Centralization, let me just button, Boom, here we go. Centralization of the pain is thus a good predictor of a successful outcome. Some people are like, yeah, it's weird. My ankle's been bothering me, but after the adjustment, now my knee is weird. Great, moving in the right direction. All right, characteristics of discodural conflicts. Dural reference, meaning you have pressure in the dura, it refers somewhere, so referral, referred pain. Dural symptoms, on, coughing, sneezing, and pressing, shifting pain. So. Yeah, it was my right shoulder, now it's my left. It hurt on this side, now it's over here. It used to be this side, now it's there. It used to be this hip, now it's that shoulder. Pain that moves around is because you're pulling on the cord and it shows up anywhere. And that's just what you feel. You don't really feel most of your organs. Pain increases during sitting or bending when position changes. Position change. After I get up, it hurts. If after I sit in a car for a while, it hurts. When I first lay down, it, it hurts for a little while, but after a while, it goes away. There's your sign. Pain worse in the morning, why? Because when you relax, when you sleep, all your muscles relax and you pull extra tension. When you're awake, your muscles hold on to everything so it doesn't move more than it should. Because if you have ligamentous damage, they're going to be unstable. And when your muscles relax, it pulls tension on the ligaments. Lumbago, in lumbago, lumbago's lum, uh, low back pain, lumbar pain, uh, down here. So in lumbago, neck flexion often hurts the lower back. Why? Why is it that if you tip your head down, it hurts your low back? because you're pulling on the cord, two ends, right there, which proves the involvement of the dura mater in the origin of the pain. Right down here. That's the scientific reference that says that exact fact. More than 60% of people struggle with low back pain after a car crash. Why do you think? Ka clack Back pain, done. Okay, conclusion. Cervical range of motion test has a high sensitivity in the prediction of handicap after acute whiplash injury. We're talking about physical handicap, not all the mental emotional stuff we talked about already? Okay. The value of cervical range of motion test is further improved by additional recording of symptoms and pain intensity. We use this test, range of motion, super easy. It has a high sensitivity and a good prediction. This is a quick video of me doing some of the tests that we do in our clinic that use all the principles that we've talked about up to this point. Enjoy. Real tight. 
buzzer alert. Pause. Okay. All right, so just real quick, um, what we've done in this video is I have paired the range of motion test with a manual muscle test because it gives us more accurate information. He turned his head side to side, didn't feel anything, but sometimes it's not the sensory nerves that are affected, it's the motor nerves. So we're going to check both of those. Go ahead. Sinoid bone. At some point you had a whiplash, a car crash, parts of the thing fall, something where you have a shoulder, you know, heavy on a little bit of this He was a hockey player. He had plenty of those. All right. With regard to the analysis, of, there is evidence for good reliability and validity of the use of manual muscle testing. MMT is manual muscle testing for patients with neuromusculoskeletal dysfunction. Nerve muscle bone. This is my jam. That's where we live. Because nerves control everything. Why wouldn't we want to know that? The observational cohort studies demonstrated good external and internal validity, and the 12 randomized control trials that were reviewed show that muscle ma manual muscle testing findings were not dependent on examiner bias. That's not, oh, you're pushing harder. Oh, you wanted to find it, so you did. No. That says that people express symptoms regardless of who's examining them as long as they follow the protocol. Good news. It's reliable. We can count on it. We can use it. It's dependable. It is accurate. And it's easy, no fancy equipment. Okay, the test retest reliability coefficients. Coefficients is the difference between for two muscle groups tested manually could not be calculated because the value between subjects were identical. The coefficient, how different were they? They couldn't be calculated because they weren't different at all. They were identical. We concluded that both manual muscle testing and handheld dynamic testing are reliable testing methods. So. When you come to clinic and you want to know what you have going on, we use this and we want you to know that it's real and it's good and it's very simple. All right. But in case that's not good enough, we have this little gem. It's a tool that's basically a force dynamometer. It checks to see the amount of force put out. Uh, I have some people that are engineers or uh, analysts and they want to see data. Well, we can provide the data for you. It's fantastic. It takes a little longer, but you know, you can read a number on a screen and it tells you exactly what's going on. Bingo. All right, participation in an inadequate solution. The things that you've tried that haven't worked. Prevents one's participation in an adequate solution. If you try the wrong thing, you'll never find the right thing. Remember, search satisfaction, you stop looking once you thought you found it. The problem is, if what you found isn't going to work for you, then it won't get you to where you want to go. That's your bad map. Okay, chiropractic care has been shown to provide better outcomes than care in a pain clinic. Need I say more? How do you fix it? Here's the secret sauce. This is what you've been waiting for. This is what I've spent years and uh, decades oh, at this point figuring out, putting together. These are the steps your body needs. Adjusting your spine is more like cracking a safe than cracking a nut. You have to put the right stimulus in in the right order. Rubik's Cube is the same thing. You can't just, you'd never confuse activity with accomplishment. With the Rubik's Cube, you can move it around and around and around and never get to the end, never figure it out on accident. So, the steps, neurological, mechanical, chemical, behavioral. What does that mean? It means if your spine is aligned, there's no chemical that can fix it. Why? Because chemical is step three. See? Down here, chemical. If it's misaligned, there's no chemical that can fix it. All right. Step one, neurological. 
Neurological control of the body creates stability and muscle function that is predictable and adequate. This prevents instability injuries to the joints that are often associated with, but seldom attributed to, dural tension. It's caused by it, but most people don't know that it happens. Once the tension is removed from the spinal cord, strength that was functionally inhibited, meaning it was off because there was tension, can return the joint to normal function. Two, mechanical. Once the nerves are functioning correctly, it is imperative to address any mechanical abnormalities that would restrict normal motion. So if your brain is sending signals to your body and your body is glued together because of all the inflammation you've had for so long, then we need to get in there and bust that up. That's the second step. But what tissue do we need to address? Not just the involved joints, but all anatomical structures that would restrict normal motion. Remember we talked about fascia and tensegrity. That's why we talked about all of that stuff. We're putting it into context now. When you understand those things, you'll understand these things and why this step is important. Until the entire pattern of distortion is resolved, the likelihood of recidivism is high, meaning falling back into old patterns. So that's where like, it, you tried it for a while, it helped, but then when you stopped, it didn't work. It's because they didn't get all of it. All of it, all of it, all of it. Okay, the chance of full recovery is low. Why? Because you keep falling back because you didn't fix the whole pattern. All right, chemical. When a nerve... When nerve stability is lost and mechanical damage has occurred, the process of inflammation is underway. Remember, sometimes it takes up to two weeks for it to happen. Okay. Uh, and that can be prolonged for years and years and years. All right. The process of inflammation is underway. Inflammation is mediated by chemistry that is used to direct the body's natural resources to clean up damaged tissue, lay down new healthy tissue. Inflammation is not the problem, but it causes pain. And pain is one of those clinical symptoms that we have to address. But if you have inflammation that's caused by a bunch of other stuff, you can't just get rid of the inflammation and expect to get healthy. You'll have less pain, but you won't solve the problem. That's where a lot of people get it wrong. They take a pill to mask this, the inflammation, and the problem persists below the, the, below the surface of perception. Um, but it's necessary to the healing process. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories stop the inflammatory process. Aspirin, Advil, Tylenol, those kind of things. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory classification drugs stop the inflammatory process, which means they stop the healing process as well, which prolongs the time it takes for you to get better or prevent it from happening altogether. This is where people end up with loose ligaments. Loose ligaments cause joint instability and re-injury. Behavioral. Respect the limitations of the injury. A change in lifestyle may be the only way to create appropriate healing environment. Chronic re-injury to the ligamentous tissue causes long-term laxity that is almost impossible to correct, even with very invasive means. So, if you have a bunch of chemical interventions and a bunch of behavioral interventions, you could end up with a long-term long ligamentous laxity that is almost impossible to correct. Do you see why this information is very, very important? Okay. Over 130 people die each day from opiates, and over 40% of those deaths are from prescribed opiates. What they don't tell you is that once... They get, people get caught off from their prescription. They go from white collar drugs to street drugs. So instead of their doctor being their dealer, they go find a different dealer. I was part of the Lake County Opiate Coalition and set out to deal with this. There was only one other doctor there and everybody else was there was really genuinely interested in helping people. I think they were doing a good job, but the only other doctor there was not a pain specialist. He was an addiction recovery specialist. I was the only one there that asked this question, like, what if we got rid of the pain that made him want the drugs in the first place? Made sense to me. All right. Surgery is not a first or even a second resort. This is back pain fact sheet that was pr produced uh, by a government institution trying to figure out back pain. Okay. How do you fix it? Neurological. There are very, very specific things that we can do to the body to help relieve tension. Now, this tool over here is called an integrator. This is not activator. Okay. Um, the initial care will be very, very gentle. Le it, will, it will lessen the dural tension, and the aim is to restore the central nervous system control over the body. Once you create neurological stability, you stop putting damage into the system, and your body can use its efforts to get you forward instead of just preventing you from backsliding. Okay. Also, neurological, emotional stress relief. We, we saw that there's psychological and psychiatric problems that happen because of a whiplash. This can help with the emotional stress. One of the clients I worked on, she woke up every single night in night terror, panic, sweating, because she was having an emotional reaction. She was having PTSD in her dreams, waking up every night. How well do you think she could heal? Not well at all. We have a solution to help with that. Okay, mechanical. Mechanical adjustments. This is where most people start, by the way. They miss this entire step and start right here. Okay, 
beneficial to reduce the range of motion restrictions that happen due to fibrous adhesions of the spine and the disc, uh, spine, and di spine and disc and disc compression. Okay, rehabilitative therapy. I think PT and rehab is fantastic. I have an entire department here specifically for that, but that's step two. If you start there, you're gonna miss this part. This part's the most important. This part's the next most important. You get the most benefit from this, the next most benefit from this. If you start here without this, you miss the most of it. Okay, here we go. Passive and active rehab with continuation of care at home to increase range of motion, muscular balance, coordination, and strength. It also reduces adhesions. When you move the tissue, it helps to break down the mechanical adhesions. But what happens if you have nerve instability when you move the tissue? You cause more damage because it's unstable. Reduce adhesions, myofascial restrictions, neuromuscular trigger points, and tissue stagnation. Okay. How do you fix it? Chemical. I do an entire talk on this slide right here. It's called uh, clean eating. Yeah, clean eating. Um, most of what you know about food is wrong. You should totally watch that. Okay. Um, focus on, on anti-inflammatory foods, proper macronutrient ratios, meal timing, and healthy food choices. Now, if you notice, we're talking about chemical. We have diet and nutritional support. I don't do drugs. I don't prescribe drugs. I can't put you on drugs. I can't take you off drugs. Okay. Opiates aren't effective in fixing this problem. We don't use them. Good news. We got better stuff. All right. Chemistry provides the building blocks of cellular health. Long-term nerve interference leads to digestive dysfunction and malnutrition. Malnutrition from whiplash right here. Okay. I have another talk. That's the gut brain talk. You should watch that too. I think it's fantastic. Um, once the body is in this state, it lacks the necessary nutrients to digest even healthy foods. Knowing exactly what is slowing or preventing healing can ensure full recovery. So if you've had it for a long time and you have gas, bloating, reflux, digestive issues, chronic pain in the right side, um, alternating loose stools versus constipation or chronic one or the other, um, a lot of times that's indicative of a neurological control mechanism that is not helping you digest properly. You have potentially have this issue. We should screen it and see what you have for real and then fix it. Here you go. A clue of something you might not have even realized. Next, behavioral. Posture assessment, tracking, coaching are all provided as part of the standard care along with rehabilitative exercises for home correction. Modified activities. Sometimes if it's damaged bad enough, we have to support you. We have to modify your level of activity so you don't continue to hurt yourself. That's part of the process. It's included too. But I will tell you, we're on step four. If you start with this, it's not going to fix the other previous three. Case reports. I'm going to give you one case report and then we're going to end for the day. Okay. Female, 40 years old, uh, 5'5", 127 pounds, came into her office on November 11th, 2019. Her complaints were hand rashes, irritation, loose stools, infertility, chronic headaches, anxiety. Previous surgeries were tonsillectomy, previous medication supplements, postnatal vitamin, iron supplement, probiotic. Um, so interesting thing here. She, was, she had infertility because she was trying. Iron supplement and probiotic means she's got gut health problems. She also has skin problems. The hand rashes, that's... Gut system, that's gut and immune. Um, iron supplement, because if you have pinched the vagus nerve, you don't produce enough stomach acid, so then you don't absorb your iron. That's right there. Uh, but that's not immediately obvious. Um, we started with the digestive consultation because that's what she came in for. She got a little bit better. We got her started on some stuff. Uh, and then she had a neurologic, she started neurological chiropractic care on January 20th. Uh, a few months, uh, yeah, a few months later. So neurological chiropractic exam found chronic neck pain, low back pain, neck, low back. See the pattern? Okay. Cervical radiculopathy. She had the referral pain that comes along with dura problems. Numbness and tingling in both hands. Cervical disc findings. Mild degenerative arthritis. Why do you think it was mild? Because she was only 40. Pain in the right hip. So we have problems top and bottom that radiate out. Here we go. As of 820, sorry, 8 of 2020, um, her chief complaints, hand rashes and irritation, gone. Loose stools, resolved. Infertility, problem solved. She got pregnant. Um, at 40, by the way, uh, chronic headaches, anxiety uh, was 80% reduced. Now, there's this whole thing in here. I will tell you, because she was, a, she was such a, an involved case, there was more than just what we did here in clinic. Uh, I have a whole team of specialists, and I will tell you, we can do amazing things. You should come check us out. But here's her testimony saying that everything was awesome. All right. Um, and then with that... Um,
this person had bunches of problems, and then those are all the things that resolved, and then here's how you find us. So if you find this presentation helpful uh, in any part or whole, this is how you get a hold of me if you want to see if this applies to you. If you want to refer somebody else to come see us, this is how you do that. If you want to check out other things that we produce and promote, um, this is how you find us. Okay? Thank you very much for your time and attention. I know this has been a lot of information. Feel free to watch this a couple of times. And if you have questions about things in here that you've watched and you don't understand, you're always welcome to come in and have a consultation with me. Uh, I'm happy to, to walk you through this. I will spend the time to show you how some of this applies to you, if it applies to you at, or, at all, or if this doesn't apply, what does? I will help you figure out what you have going on. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Danny McLean. Have a great day.